Hello, this is part five in a series of videos on the evidence for astrology. And what we're showing in this series of videos is that there is very convincing evidence that astrology actually works, that there are actual measurable effects and there's tangible things that happen in our lives, various kinds of behaviors, such as, for example, what I presented in the previous section in part four, on bipolar disorder. People that have bipolar disorder are born with particular planetary configurations that make them more inclined to have bipolar disorder. That research on bipolar disorder is very compelling. It gives us a lot of confidence because we conducted a hypothesis test. We gathered new data and confirmed the model. In this video, I'm going to show you various research that we're doing that's a different stages of development to show you some of the ongoing projects that we're doing. So here's uh, one of them was on extroversion and introversion. And this was a sophisticated study. It began in 2010. It was sophisticated in that we collected 944 psychological test scores. And specifically, it's the ISENC personality inventory. It's a personality test. And the part of the test that was given was on extroversion, introversion. So we obtained 944 scores on extroversion, introversion. This is very exciting for research because we can go and look to see, is there something in the birth charts of the people who are more extroverted? versus those who are more introverted. And we have their birth data that they had gotten from a birth certificate or birth record, what we call AA accuracy. So this was a wonderful study that I conducted with Dr. David Fink, a psychology professor. He was the chair of a department of the psychology department at a small college in Vermont. He collected the data, was interested in analyzing it, he was particularly interested in the Galkoan sectors. You're probably familiar with the Galkoan sectors. It's this idea that certain parts of the sky just above the eastern horizon, for example, are more sensitive. And he thought if Saturn was above the eastern horizon, that would incline to introversion because Saturn tends to be focused more in, you know, introverted, deeper. Jupiter would tend to make more extroverted. That's what he was interested in. I also analyzed it for these vibrational configurations where I expected Saturn in seven vibration aspects to be introverted. You could understand that by watching the previous videos in this series or if you're familiar with vibrational astrology theory. I thought that Jupiter in 11 vibration, for example, would tend to be extroverted. So we had different kinds of things we could look at, Galco and sectors, these vibrational patterns, to see what's going on. If we get the kind of results we're expecting, this will be consistent with the results obtained from other research. So here is the astro signature that I developed in 2020. So this went through various stages of improvement. First, Analysis was done in 2010, <clears throat> excuse me, then I looked at it more carefully in 2014, and then again in 2020. And the formula I came up with 2020 is right here. This is what it looks like in the Sirius software, where we create the astro signature. In other words, the combination of things that we think are related to whatever it is we're studying. And I identified three things. One is Sun Jupiter or Mars Jupiter in vibrations 11, 11 times 2, 11 times 4, 11 times 8, 11 times 16, and 11 times 11. This is given 50 points, meaning very inclined to extroversion. And there's our Sun Saturn in 7, 7 times 2, 7 times 4, 7 times 8, and 7 times 7. Minus 20, negative means making you more introverted. And we in looking at the exploratory research, we found confirmation for an idea 
that's very popular in astrology, which is that when planets are near the top of the chart, in, for example, the 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th house, they reach more out into the world. Jupiter is the big expansive planet. And sure enough, Jupiter in houses 8, 9, 10, and 11 inclined to extroversion. So we gave it the 50 points. Uh, if the Jupiter was conjunct the 10th house cusp, the MC, and then weaker as it got farther away. So as Jupiter reached the top of the chart, we gave it the most points. So we had three basic ideas, all very simple. When you look at the astro signature, notice the orbs are all the same, 16 degrees in the vibrational chart. And, and here's the one for Jupiter. Uh, so uh, actually, what we did here is it was not, let me correct what I said, it was not Jupiter conjunct the midheaven, it's Jupiter square the ascendant. So Jupiter waxing 270 degrees to the ascendant with an orb of 60 degrees. So let me correct that. It's, it's not Jupiter on the midheaven, it's Jupiter square the ascendant. So when Jupiter is 90 degrees before the ascendant, that would be the 10th house cusp using equal houses, we give it 50 points. It's basically a very similar idea. Jupiter is near the top of the chart. Okay, those are the three things. What we like about this is that we have a nice, elegant, simple concept. We have 944 cases of actual scores on this psychological test, which is a highly respected test that's gone through lots of review and improvements in the psychological literature. And here's the results. Jupiter in 11 vibration, just the Jupiter 11 vibration. In other words, this first part of the astro signature, that gives us a very good result. Probability less than one out of a thousand. Just that alone. Saturn in seven vibration, was not very significant, but we included it because it was in the right direction, it fits with our theory, and it, it, a T value of 0 0.09, not terrific, but when you combine the first two together, you get an even better result. Uh, so we, we included that in the astro signature, Jupiter near the top of the chart, houses 8, 9, 10, and 11, using equal houses, fairly good. And when we combine all three together, we get a p-value of less than one out of 10,000. That's a good result. We like to get a p-value in the range of one out of 10,000 when we're building a model. And it confirms our ideas, fits perfectly with the vibrational astrology theory. So it's another example of research that's been done we could now do a hypothesis test. If we could gather data on this extroversion, introversion scale and, uh, and, and apply this formula, we would then do a hypothesis test. Just that would give us very, very high confidence if it confirms our theory. By the way, there are non-astrological things related to extroversion, introversion. One of the things we noticed was that uh, the older the person is, the more introverted they are, and went into the psychological journals and found that there's already been research done on that confirming, <clears throat> excuse me, what makes common sense, older people are more introverted. So when you combine the age of the person with the astrology, you get even a better model. And this is one of the things for the future, is combining the astrology with non-astrological factors, such as how old the person is. Then you get even a, what we call a greater effect size, more impressive results. So that was exciting to see that. Um, okay, so that was one study. So another research that we've done is on athletes, where this was similar to the research we did on rock and roll uh, musicians we talked about in a previous uh, video in this series, where we went to a website, 
we just went to Google's search engine and we said greatest athletes of all time. We found two websites that listed what sports fans consider to be the greatest athletes. We entered their data, called up all the ones who have AA data, and we got this list of athletes, Wayne Gretzky, Michael Jordan, Muhammad Ali, Pele, Bruce Lee, Steffi Graf, Tom Brady, Friends, Beckenbauer, Jack Nicklaus, Boris Becker, Tiger Woods, and Chris Everett. Different sports, the most exceptional athletes of all time, and we have AA data. So sometimes we just start with a small sample just to see if we can see something consistent. And what we found is that these athletes have four of seven what we call power planets. The power planets are Sun, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Pluto, everything except Moon, Venus, and Neptune. Those seven planets, if four of the seven of them are aspected to each other in the seven vibration, then we have a strong inclination to be a great athlete. That's what happens with the greatest athletes of all time. Again, it's consistent with our theories of how we think these aspects work. And again, what we found in this research on athletes, same thing we found with bipolar disorder and other research, the vibrations go very, very high. Contrary to what, you know, we would just naturally assume, contrary to what I guessed many decades ago when I started this research, I didn't expect these very high vibrations. And so here's a summary of our current theory regarding athletic ability. If you have these power planets, a large planetary configuration in 28 vibration, it gives fierce determination. The person goes within, focuses, they get in the zone. Very intense practice, focus. 35 vibration gives a talent, this facility, this natural ability in a wide range of sports. We found seven times 11 fast reaction times. For example, in Muhammad Ali. Also, we found it in golfers. That quick swing, smooth, a lot of practice, but some kind of power release happens with the 77. We found seven times 13 in people who seek the extraordinary, like Bruce Lee in martial arts, and we found the soft seven, seven times three, seven times nine, seven times six, so vibrations like 21 and 63 show up in sports like tennis, golf, and baseball, which emphasize a gracefulness and a smoothness more than a, a, a fighting aggressive situation like you would have in boxing or American football, as, so that shows up. So these, this is the model. This is an early stage of research building upon our theory T taking a few extreme cases of the greatest athletes, we build the theory. At some point in the future, we will uh, take a, an astro signature built of these things and apply it to our database of, of great athletes collected by the Gaul coins and other athletes, and we will do more research. So the, I'm sharing with you different kinds of research we're doing that's at different stages of development. So this is our work on athletes, and to give you an idea, if, if you're a student of astrology, these are what the charts of the greatest athletes look like. Here's the 35 vibration chart of Michael Jordan, and you see a huge T-square, Sun, Uranus, opposition Mercury, and these three planets, Sun, Uranus, and Mercury that I've got in yellow highlight square, Saturn, Pluto. There's that Saturn, Pluto of intense focus, of intense uh, you might say sacrifice, giving up everything to just be on the court and, and focus on it. Jupiter and Neptune come in. So this is five of the power planets. Remember the power planets in athleticism are everything but Moon, Venus, and Neptune. So Sun, Uranus, Mercury, Saturn, Pluto, five planets, all tightly aspected. Look at the thick aspect lines. And then additional planets just add a little more power to it. Jupiter and Neptune coming in, conjunct the Sun years, just adds a little bit more. And Mars comes in a little bit to the Saturn-Pluto weekly, adds just a pinch more. 
you already have five planets tightly connected together. This gives tremendous capacity for athleticism. One of the things that's uh, surprising in our findings is that Mars does not need to be primary and fundamental, contrary to what we might have anticipated. So the research confirms a lot of the ideas we have, and then it refines our understanding and you might say corrects things, that Mars does not need to be essential, any of the seven power planets involved. So this is just to give you a sense of what happens. Here's Wayne Gretzky, considered the number one hockey player of all time um, by, by many uh, fans of hockey. <clears throat> Excuse me. And again, we see 35 vibration. That is, if we go back to Michael Jordan, yes, that was also 35 vibration. And there are the four planets, Mars, Pluto, in an extremely tight opposition, squeezed between Jupiter and Saturn, all have these hard red lines, hard aspect red lines, all thick, very tight. And you'll see some dashed red lines coming in, meaning they're coming in at an even higher vibration and influencing this. Neptune comes in uh, with dashed lines to Jupiter and Mars. Neptune does not weaken a pattern. Any additional planets, will add a little more force. You need the main four, and then if others come in, you'll see that Sun is weakly conjunct Mars, and there's a grand trine of Sun, Mercury, Saturn, so that's also three power planets. We need four, which we already have in the yellow highlighted, and then this grand trine comes in, adding even more power to it. So four planets tightly connected, other planets sometimes coming in, adding even additional strength to this configuration, or you might say to parts of the configuration. Sun and Mercury connecting just mainly to the, to the Saturn. It adds a little more. You need the, the fundamental four. So we have a clear idea of how these circuits work. We build a clear model, a clear understanding, sometimes only with half a dozen or a dozen charts. Then we can go out to a larger database. We can use it in our consultations, and we can test it more carefully. So this is how we build the model. So our question that we laid out at the beginning of this series of five videos is, is there evidence that astrology really works? Yes, and I'm also showing the procedure for how we discover it. It's not just taking the standard astrological ideas that have been passed down historically or that people have found in their consultations. It's a matter of using knowledge discovery, KD as we call it, methods to tease out of the data information, taking extreme cases, using what we call content expertise, people who have expertise in this kind of analysis, finding consistent patterns, and then seeing if it will work with larger and larger databases, and then with new data. So I'm showing you the realistic process that we go through to make these discoveries. Here's another example of Pele, the footballer, or what we call in the United States soccer. And here is his 28th vibration chart. And look at this enormous configuration. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, all within two degrees, square Mercury, making this hard aspect we call a sesquiquadrate to Pluto. That's one, two, three, four, five planets all connected together. Mars is within orb to everything except Pluto. So we call that a five-planet configuration. It's also a six-planet spreading configuration. And there are additional soft aspects coming in from other planets. Extremely powerful, extremely motivated uh, person. So this, um, you know, this is the kind of configuration. So this is what we do. We take these extreme people, the best of the best of the best, Unbelievable. You think of all the people playing basketball or, or f football, or what we call United States soccer, all over the world. And this guy, Pelle, stands out of hundreds of thousands or millions of kids playing this sport. He's got to have something extraordinary. And this is the extraordinary configuration that we found. So these are like case studies of extreme people to find the extraordinary planetary configuration that 
that makes sense with the extraordinary talent that they have. And now we can look at uh, golfers, baseball players, tennis players, often having the soft seven. This is Tiger Woods, the great golfer. And this is his 63 vibration chart, nine times uh, seven. So, and there you see the huge configuration. Saturn making a grand trine with Mercury, Uranus, and Pluto. It's actually what we call a kite. One, two, three, four, five planets. Jupiter and Saturn down the middle. Pluto and a Mercury, Uranus conjunction and Saturn. There it is. Again, five of the seven power planets and gives a special talent for a softer, gentler, less aggressive sport like golf could also apply to tennis and baseball. I'm not saying these aren't highly competitive and intense, but there's not the head-on physical uh, banging up against each other as much. And the smoothness and the fluidity you have to have. It's, uh, th these kind of sports, um, you find people with these configurations often excel, and he grows up playing golf from an extremely early age. You need everything together. You need the opportunity. You need the training at a very young age. You need the right chart. So many things must be perfectly aligned for this to, to happen, to get these greatest athletes. Here's Steffi Graf, one of the greatest tennis players of all time. Um, some people uh, rank her as second greatest of all time behind Serena Williams. Anyway, she's one of the best of the best. Here again, 63 vibration, same chart we just looked at, same vibrational chart that we just looked at for Tiger Woods. Saturn, Pluto, Mercury, there again, Saturn, Pluto, very common, all within five degrees, which is tight in a vibrational chart, and they're all trine sun. All three within orb of trining the sun, there's our four planets in a soft vibration, giving the potential to excel in a sport like tennis, golf, or baseball. And there's additional things. Uranus is within 10 degrees of the sun. Venus is within two degrees of the sun. They just add a pinch more, just a little bit more, and you have the essential four planets. So this is what it looks like. This is how we do the research. We build the model. We examine. We develop these case studies. We develop the theory. This research on athletic, athletic ability will continue in the future. I'm just telling the state of it right now in September 2022. There are only a handful of us doing this research. We have to develop the software. We have to go through the data. It's very time consuming. But even with a small group of people, we've made these big uh, steps forward that you don't hear about in astrology, that a lot of astrologers are not data driven and looking to perfect the models using modern research methods. But this is what we do. It's very advanced, very sophisticated, many kinds of research at different stages of development. And I'm showing some of the research here that's not as uh, developed, not taken to as high a level as the bipolar disorder research, but still showing you how we're doing the research, this, the levels that we're at in coming years, We'll have more information on this. We have a conference, Vibrational Astrology Conference, first week of March. Uh, in the last few years and for the coming years, it'll be in Gainesville, Florida, for, to present the latest findings and discoveries and how we use them in birth charts. Okay, so again, one of the important things about this research is that um, the data is not cherry-picked. As soon as you have some control over who the data, who is in the, the analysis, it loses confidence. You, can't, you cannot have great confidence. But we're taking these from uh, accepted sources and, and just analyzing those charts. And then you'll see some alternative kinds of things that I haven't shown you. It can be in midpoint configurations. With Jack Nicklaus, the great golfer, it was 77 vibration. Um, Serena Williams, tennis, it's again 63, which makes sense, but it's an in, it's an in a very detailed midpoint. So there are aspects and midpoint structures, two ways that the person can excel. 
This is showing Serena Williams 63, same vibration that we saw in two other charts. So very good for sports like golf, tennis, which is of course Serena Williams sport. And this is a huge midpoint configuration. I've got it summarized here. Pluto is at the midpoint. Pluto in, in with the light blue highlight here, rectangular white blue, is squeezed between Mercury and Uranus and also between Mars and Jupiter. And this here is what we call a tree diagram. The orbs are incredibly small, 10 minutes, three minutes, they're almost exact. It's what we call a midpoint isotrap. When one planet makes two midpoint structures, that is incredibly powerful. Oh my God, powerful. And we're talking about Serena Williams. And then on top of that, you take the Mars and Pluto, which we see here in, uh, also in, in this pink color, uh, and Sun is opposition, the midpoint of them. So the Sun over here is in between these two. So we take one more planet, we get another midpoint structure. We have Jupiter and Uranus over here in this midpoint isotrop. In other words, this planet making two midpoint structures. And then Uranus is at Jupiter-Saturn. It's a huge, all seven power planets tied together in an enormous symmetry pattern. So I'm showing this more for the interest of astrologers and people developing theory and understanding. These are the kinds of things we do uh, in, in our research. We build a clear model with a, the most extreme, the greatest of all time, Serena Williams. Why is she so exceptional? What is it? It takes a lot of things. She has the physical strength. Again, her, her father was training her from a very, very, very early age. She was playing with her sister Venus. She had, you know, people to, to compete with. All of these things, plus this fantastic chart. This is where you get the greatest of the greatest of the greatest. The combination of all those factors. If she's not brought up in that environment, she's not exposed to it, she doesn't get in tune with it, it'll come out in some other way. Okay, here's Jack Nicklaus to show you again midpoint configurations. He also has what we call a midpoint isotrap configuration, Sun at Mars, Jupiter midpoint, and Saturn, Pluto, reinforced by another midpoint structure. This light blue thing shows what we call the isotrap and the Sun right in the middle. It's a beautiful symmetrical pattern where the Sun is in the middle of this isosceles trapezoid. This is the sacred geometry that makes for the power. Just summarizing quickly, uh, um, I think I already have other videos that go into detail on this. If not, I can do it. I'm, I don't want to spend huge amounts of time on this here. I just want to give you the idea of how we build a clear, definite model. We will be testing this model with new data within the next, probably the next year or two. Uh, but I thought I would share you the state of this research so you could see that what we're doing is we are building a large, very, very large body of data and different research projects at different stages of development. So here's a summary of the things that we see in the charts of the greatest athletes. You can pause this and read it if you want to. I've already gone over all this stuff and it gives it some examples of people with these configurations. So you, and here are some other kinds of planetary configurations. There are different ways. The vibrational universe we live in is very sophisticated and intricate, but we are moving into this fabric of the universe and understanding it and analyzing it and building models that we can confirm even with a hypothesis test, which means checking against new data. And also what you'll see with some of these great athletes is they will have more than one planetary configuration. Serena Williams has a powerful configuration in her 63 vibration, which I just showed you in a few slides ago, and the 8 vibration, which is fundamental. She also has an extremely powerful configuration involving four power planets, Saturn, Uranus, Mars, Pluto, and this describes uh, Serena Williams style. She's explosive, temperamental. She's a power person. Mars, Uranus, Pluto. Whoa, that is Serena Williams. So not only do we see 
the overall talent, but we see the style of the player, we see exactly how they function, and we can look at the transits to see when these things get triggered, and at some point we hope to have very solid research showing the planetary configurations that trigger these configurations that people were born with and give them the ability to excel. So when Serena Williams is really on, there will be, there'll be planets in the sky activating and resonating with this is what we've already seen. And I give examples of that in the book on bipolar disorder. You know, the, the Astrology of Bipolar Disorder, a Scientific Breakthrough. That book shows how Marilyn Monroe and Judy Garland, at the time of their death, how their very sensitive configurations were triggered. And we show a graph, and the graph peaks right at that time. So we have a lot of evidence for this. We're building the models, we're testing it, and ultimately we will test with new data and show that these formulas really work. So again, I'm sharing the different stages of development and different kinds of research. Um, and here I just discuss how very high vibrations are important, how midpoints are important. Um, some additional information here, a quote from Nik Nikola Tesla. I still haven't confirmed that it's a genuine quote and what the source is, but it is, if you wish to understand the universe, think of energy, frequency, and vibration, that's what vibrational astrology is all about. It's all about resonance and vibration. And I'll quickly mention our accident research. I have entire videos on the accident research, but just to give you an idea, we here's an example of where we're looking at a bi-wheel, transits at the time of the accident, triggering the natal planetary configurations. Um, it's fascinating. And we do see midpoint configurations involved. And what are the typical planets? Mars, Saturn, Uranus. Wow, exactly what we expect as astrologers. Mars, Saturn, Uranus. If you're a student of astrology or a professional, you hear Mars, Saturn, Uranus. Sounds like accidents. But it's not in the obvious ways that we think of. It's in these higher vibrations. So a lot of what we understand in astrology is very true. We're just learning more clearly how it works. This is a, uh, a report, it's information that we get from the Sirius software. It shows midpoint structures formed between two charts when Princess Diana died. Look at these orbs. This is Uranus at the time of the accident, opposition her sun Mars midpoint nine minutes. Transiting Mars was conjunct her Saturn-Uranus midpoint seven minutes. There's the Mars-Saturn-Uranus. Here's a Mars-Uranus with the Sun. Two midpoint structures nearly exact. The accident occurs. This is so exciting. So we've done quite a bit of research on the accidents and we've refined the formula. This is showing some of the patterns. I have other videos on the accidents, so I won't go over all of this here, but just to show you all of the kinds of research. Look at this one. A, a person was in a severe accident when transiting Mars and Uranus were trying, making a grand trine to the natal Mars. Mars, Uranus to Mars. So, so much for great trines being all great and wonderful. They're not always great and wonderful. They, they can activate, um, you know, we put a value. We say an accident is a bad thing. The astrology chart just says, okay, we'll just let Mars Uranus fly. Just whoop, let it go. And it can lead to an accident. The, so here's another case where, again, we see this is what we call a mixed midpoint structure. Here's transiting Mars and Uranus in the outer wheel. Here's the natal Mars. Transiting Mars is at the midpoint of the natal Mars and the transiting Uranus. If you haven't heard of this before, that might make your head spin. You can pause the video, think about it. You get mixed midpoint structures. These are some of the exciting breakthrough discoveries that we have found that consistently occur at the time of accidents. And here's some of the results that we've obtained. Here's another example. 11 vibration, which is unstable and erratic. Things can happen in 11 vibration. 
and we can see the accident proneness in a person's 11 vibration when it gets triggered by transits um, there's a tendency to accidents we've done research on marriage there are 20,916 couples married couples with recorded birth times that Francoise and Mikhail Gauquin collected it's in the Sirius software we analyzed it we went through we found out that 55 vibration 13 vibration 7 vibration 4 vibration these are some of the vibrations that occur with these married couples it's there it's in the power of what we call the composite chart so again we have separate videos on this I'm just reviewing some of the wide range of research that we've done and and the conclusions that we've reached about what it means so I'm just giving you a quick overview gold price research that's been done and how we developed a, a model for gold prices and we confirmed it with additional data and how we do so many kinds of research not just on behaviors but on the astrology to find out what the vibrations mean taking people with the most planets in a vibration we presented these results on vi vibrations 37 41 43 in the 2018 vibrational astrology conference and again in the 2021 conference so we're doing research on what the elements of astrology mean what different people have in their charts it's very very exciting we've confirmed what zodiac signs do um, using this extreme case sampling housing prices will we model uh, how prices will change here's a graph of actual prices and predicted prices and let's see the blue is the predicted price the orange is the actual housing price and it it matches fairly well you can see here that this peak wasn't gotten exactly this rise in prices we have it going up and we do a statistical test to and that gives us a p-value probability so in the serious software we can graph the price the actual prices the predicted prices and it will tell us how good the fit is as a probability so it's beautiful we have a simple formula that predicts prices uh, and here's a forecast of prices housing prices for the future showing that prices in general continue to go up until about 2028 they reach a peak and then they come down we'll see if that's true so we can make the forecast and see what happens just giving you a quick overview of the many kinds of research that we're doing different stages to to analyze different things and there's other research that we do do the minor planets and asteroids have any meaning we do controlled research and we find out the research we did on Chiron Ceres Pallas Juno Vesta and other asteroids very exciting so again every March yeah, first, usually first week of March in Gainesville Florida is the conference we show how we're using the latest discoveries so we're on a path of knowledge discovery we're we're building models testing the models and and applying them very practically now I want to mention one more thing vibrational astrology is not the only area of of astrology where there's careful research there are other people doing great research as well um, and let's see I think I have it on the next slide where is this um, oh here it is so there's a, a magazine called correlation magazine produced by the Astrological Association of Great Britain and they publish peer-reviewed research in astrology using other systems so this is great news it's not just vibrational astrologers there are other people the International Society for Astrological Research that I mentioned in this top paragraph also promoting excellent research and some other organizations as well going back to my other slides that I skipped over here's our conclusions the bipolar research especially suggests that measurable results can be obtained in astrology number two accent research introversion extroversion and other areas of research like the athletics uh, performance very promising areas of research showing great results 
Uh, we get consistent results. Every research we do, we've done shows the 11 vibration is restless, moving, potentially unstable. Um, and for those of you who are students of astrology, if you use zodiac signs, look at the videos I've made on the extreme case sampling studies. This gives tremendously greater confidence in our understanding of zodiac signs. Astrology does not need to be just personal opinion and personal experience and, and historical traditions. We can use modern research methods. We do use modern research methods to clarify, improve, and elevate astrology of every kind, including just what the zodiac signs mean. It's exciting. Uh, most astrologers still are not, um, you know, uh, tuned in to what's going on with this revolution. Um, but people around the world, people in the sciences, people in all areas of life, getting excited about a 21st century form of astrology. It works with clients. It works with databases. It's a whole new world. So point number six, astrology is undergoing a revolutionary change. It's becoming a reliable tool that is evidence-based and it will go mainstream. It's going mainstream quite rapidly. Um, and you can join the revolution. Astrology as we know it, using only personal examples, will become obsolete. Um, because we're in the modern world where we can confirm this in so many different ways. The large and growing body of consistent findings, increasingly greater statistical sig significance, more replications of the findings, the extremely simple and clear astrological rules, the ability for some of these things to be replicated with new data relatively easily, it's all moving us forward with this new form of evidence-based astrology. So this new astrological era has already begun. And all these different research studies reinforce and support each other. So in this last video, I've just shared, you know, some, not all, but, you know, a survey of some of the different kinds of research, different levels. Some are more polished, more refined, more advanced than others. Um, they're at different stages. I would say, again, the bipolar disorder research is the one that is the most advanced. And again, here's the information about the Vibrational Astrology Conference. Um, maybe I should show you what do I have here. Okay, if we go to, let me shrink this down. I'll just show you this very quickly. Bring a browser into the area of my screen that I'm capturing. Okay, that's, uh, that's good enough. If you go to astrosoftware.com, you'll see the conference um, link in this menu bar at the top, and it will tell you about the ne uh, next conference. Since I'm making this in September 2022, the next conference is in 2023, and there is the information about it. And that's about it. Let me go back to my PowerPoint. Um, so, yes, yeah, so that's it, my friends. Lots of things happening. We're starting the Cosmobiology Institute, the nonprofit uh, research institute. It's at cosmobiology.org. So many things happening. So that's it. We are done. I've had some questions about what is in the charts of astrologers. People got very interested in that. I will make another video about uh, what's going on there because people have asked about it. That'll be kind of an addendum. But our main five videos on is there evidence for astrology is completed. I'm at 43, running on 44 minutes. So this video is a little bit longer than, than most of the others. But there you have it, my friends. If someone has the question, is there any evidence that astrology works? You can point them to the first video in the series and tell them to watch all five videos. There's your answer. So... The scientists who continue to say astrology is rubbish and there's nothing to it and the big media people need to do what we call literature review, see what's going on. This is growing. This is available. The book on bipolar disorder research, it's available through almost every bookseller known. This is happening and it's growing and you just can't continue to ignore it. So people are becoming aware that this new modern evidence-based form of astrology that uses modern research methods 
and it has very, very strong support, it exists. It's happening. It's real. So there you have it, my friends. Thank you very much for listening. God bless. Namaste.